Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to those of you who are in Hong Kong, and good evening, um, Dr. Mark Labberton. And welcome those of you who are viewing this in, uh, at home on the internet. Welcome to the second day of the China Graduate School of Theology, Josephine So Culture and Ethics Lecture Week. We had a very fruitful and um, sharing discussion yesterday. If this is the first day that you joined the lecture, I would like to welcome you to the second day of our lecture on the crisis of American white evangelicalism. So just a housekeeping item, if you would like to view the lecture in um, Cantonese or Mandarin, you can scroll down to the web page to the um, bottom and you can find the respect respective language, so either in English, Cantonese or Mandarin. So today, we are honored and fortunate to have Dr. Mark Labberton with us again to share with us about Christology and our culture. And the title of today's lecture is The Battle of American White Evangelicalism That Exalts Its Christology While Its Culture Eats Its Soul. And without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Mark Labberton. Thank you very much. It's my great privilege and honor to be with you again. And as we go through our lecture tonight and then have opportunities for questions and discussion later, I look forward to that as well as the respondents that are going to comment as, as well. So Christology and our culture, uh, we will reflect on the battle of American white evangelicalism that exalts its Christology while its culture eats its soul. In 2004, at the height of George W. Bush's administration and new waves of the press exploring the meaning and character of evangelicalism, David Brooks, a New York Times columnist, wrote an article entitled, Who is John Stott? It was a brief article, and yet it gave uh, a wonderful picture of John a remarkable overview of his work, but also of John Stott's character and influence. And all of this as a justification, Brooks said, for saying, surely this is the one by whom the best of evangelicalism should be measured. It captured the faithfulness, the strong and careful theological, pastoral, cultural, and ethical mind and spirit of John. Obviously, John was not from the United States, so I am borrowing him tonight. But the evangelicalism that he represented and promoted is one of the strongest and most significant voices that has shaped a wide segment of U.S. and, I dare say, global evangelicalism. John's primary authorship of not only many books, but of the Lausanne Covenant, was a witness to his distinctive character. Though born into a truly upper-class English home, the gospel in John's life shattered the hold of a colonialist vision or attitude into which he was born. And he became a Christ-centered globalist and a profound friend. Having had the personal privilege of working for and with John Stott for over 30 years, I can witness to the fact that John's Christology was as lived as it was affirmed. In fact, he was a more authentic disciple the more deeply one came to know him. A second image I want you to hold in your mind is that of Franklin Graham, son of Billy Graham. While Franklin Graham's father was still alive, and a direct private and public influence on Franklin. Franklin operated inside the character and narrative that had been established by his father, a US and global icon of American and white evangelicalism. Franklin Graham founded Samaritan's Purse, a Christian relief organization, which is an expression of Christian compassion similar to the founding of other relief and development agencies, such as World Vision, Compassion International, and others. As Billy Graham's health declined and Billy withdrew from public life, 
Franklin's voice increased in different ways. And unfortunately, not least in its shrill volume and tone. By the time the Trump administration was in place in the United States White House, Franklin seemed to have become a true believer in the service that the Trump presidency might be to evangelical purposes. And Franklin piled on with all that he had. He made support of Trump a vehement and often spoken of cause and explicitly equated support for Trump with being a faithful Christian, including Trump's America First policy. I lift up these two voices as contrasting exemplars of two very different American, in quotes, since John is not technically American, but American types of evangelicalism. John Stott and Franklin Graham share a common seedbed of faith and theology centered in Jesus Christ. And they defend largely common versions of a theology of the cross as the way of salvation, dependency on the Bible as God's unique and authoritative word, and God's evangelistic mission in the world as well as God's evidences of goodness through relief and development efforts and the primacy of the church as God's instrument in the world. However, they demonstrate quite different views of gospel and culture. And herein lies the subject that I want us to consider in this second lecture. Stott was an Anglican born into a family in which he was taken to All Souls Church in London week by week by his mother, while his father, who was an atheist and a surgeon, stayed at home a few blocks away. He lived in London his whole life. He was never married. He regularly engaged in private and in public with a very diverse array of people and opinions. By the grace of God, and a lived Christology, or incarnationalism. The gospel allowed him to break free from many of the strictures that might have helped, held or kept him culturally bound. It was centrally his Christology, his view of the radical reorienting reality of God embodied in human flesh, emphasizing, serving, empathizing rather, serving, healing, suffering, dying, and rising that transformed John's life and social location. His Christology moved him to live and move in a different way in the world. He, in fact, lived in a simple two-room apartment or flat, doing ministry focused on study, writing, preaching, and travel. His Christology led him to listen. That, in turn, led him to hear and trust, understand and act on the perspectives of brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world. When I recently spoke with Rene Padilla, one of the founders and leaders of Missio Integral in Colombia, South America, he said that what stood out about Stott, among other Western white evangelical leaders, was simply this, that he listened, that he wanted to know and understand us, not to control or use us. Despite Franklin Graham's exposure to the global church, despite his father's sympathies and growing understanding of a world beyond the small town in which they lived in North Carolina. Despite the good work of the Samaritan's Purse around the world, I regrettably say that, in my view, Franklin's life speaks most loudly of his social location, not his Christology. Candidly, and with my own self-critique in this as well, Franklin sounds often much more like a white, Southern, male, privileged person who lives and trusts in Christian language 
to justify and defend American exceptionalism and exclusivity. In other words, his his Christology does not seem to have broken through and relocated him or redefined his life or his social location. Admitting I may see him wrongly, and I well could, my impression is that his Christology has never expanded his core perception of God or neighbor or self. His view of authority, of power, of pragmatism, and even of nationalism have not been recast by his Christology, but rather the reverse. He trusts deeply in American exceptionalism. No wonder when the Samaritan Purse set up a coronavirus clinic in Central Park in New York City. It initially made a major issue over the fact that it would not be serving LGBT people. His politics impaired his compassion for suffering people. The Jesus who sat at table with sinners and tax collectors, with the weak and needy, seemed captive to Franklin's social ideology. The magnanimity of grace appears trumped. That is, it was overtaken by a Trumpian view of things. So my concern tonight is, or this morning on your end, is an observation and a conviction. It's this, that American white evangelicals tell ourselves that we are living our Christology. That is our public message. But the more likely truth is that we are often living our cultural location, not our Christology. Of course, we all know that the relationship between the gospel and culture is an historic Christian dilemma. As we know, God entered culture, and to make that affirmation is not simplistic, though its familiarity may suggest otherwise. Once God has entered human experience, though equal with God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, and finding himself in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient, even unto death. And therefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In ways beyond the philosophical mind-body problem, we now ask through the lens of the incarnation itself what we have to what we have in order to face new kinds of mind-body, body-spirit, theology, culture, confession, action issues. This dilemma is not new, but the way it manifests itself in American white evangelicalism shows itself in particularly problematic ways. When taken at its surface, it has found a broad cultural acceptability, but beneath it exposes a problematic underbelly. Outside observers to white evangelicalism have seen this for some time, but let's delineate some of the unfortunate markers. A crisis first, then, of Christological knowing. American white evangelicalism is living out an inadequate, even failed, theological or Christological epistemology. What is claimed to be known seems to sit on the surface rather than penetrating our underlying and controlling social location. Consciously or otherwise, the Christ we know does not necessarily lead to a life that demonstrates the radical recreative work of being remade after the image of Jesus Christ himself. It feels more like a form of imitative knowledge than of penetrative knowledge. And when the absence of Christ-like fruit in places of pain and injustice seems so prominent and guarded, one has to ask if the Christ that they name is real and knowable enough for the real world. In other words, 
at the core of the crisis is an unacknowledged, unintegrated Christology, in which the evangel seems to sit on the surface of history, rather than being the penetrating and recreating uh, of the human story itself. In some white evangelical spaces, faithful theology is verbal and dogmatic, but spiritually abstract rather than self-critical and convicting about social realities that lie outside the white, middle-class, and male cultural box. The denial of racism and of white supremacy, the denial of the coronavirus and trust in science, the denial of the election recently in the United States and its outcome, all have millions of white evangelical supporters. Even in the second election, 80% of evangelicals voted for President Trump. Tragically, when these denials are offered specifically as an expression of Christian faith, then the evangel itself appears to have less and less to do with reality, the world in which ordinary people live and work, suffer, and play. In this circumstance, our Christology starts to appear as a fantasy rather than as knowledge. Does our Christology do the work of redefining and reconstructing our personal and public lives, giving evidence that we are a, a, a reflection of what lies beyond our sociology? Is not this what living in, but not of the world, is actually meant to produce? And not just in piety, but in evidences in the public square. It seems, by painful contrast, that white evangelicalism does not really attend to being made new, but being internally and eternally safe. It doesn't intersect with our ordinary everyday world. So how has this come to be? I want to say, suggest several reasons. Out of fear, a crisis of pursuing power is upon us more than pursuing wisdom. There are many manifestations of this white evangelical orientation that set the stage for how white evangelicals live and thrive. They're, they are cultural premises, racially, economically, and culturally. They are like the elements that set the stage for the faith that they promote. There can be a variation in personality, but the main elements that I'm going to describe are fairly predictable, even necessary, and they show little penetration of a living, reordering Christology. First, whiteness. As you are aware, the dominant culture of the U.S. numerically and culturally is white and European. By dominant, I mean both the largest and the most influential, the population that holds the primary power roles and levers of cultural influence. This is fast changing in the United States. And by 2045, just 24 years from now, the US will no longer be white majority. The racial separation and division underneath the narrative of America as a melting pot is a secret in plain view. That is, we say that there is a, we are a melting plot, but, but anybody who has lived in the United States understands that frequently that is not true. We have proximate diversity. We are near one another, but not deep or intimate diversity. In fact, that is as true or more true of American evangelicalism than it is of other institutions or groups of people. A lot of energy of white evangelicalism can be found in the southern part of the United States. And its legacy of racial separation directly shows in the separation of white and black churches, even now in newly planted and growing southern congregations, they are still deeply racially divided. Churches established and maintained for, maintained for white people, even those that often claim to be multiracial, are still dominantly white. Let me give you an example 
of how this formed from early days and how sadly so much of this same description could be used even today. Some of you may know the name of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was an emancipated slave and one of the finest orators in American history, not just among African Americans, but among all people that have lived and spoken in the United States. And what I'm about to read to you is something that he spoke on July 5th, the day after American Independence Day, July 4th. He had been asked to speak, and he said that he wouldn't be able to speak on the 4th, but that he would speak and address an almost entirely white audience on the 5th of July. And these are some of his words. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him, more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless your denunciations of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to the slave mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy a thin veil to cover up the crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. This is not a nation, there is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. The structures and policies and even more the culture of whiteness that Frederick Douglass is describing in 1852 are still so thick in the United States that what he says speaks far more loudly than the evidence of serious discipleship in which we become transformed as a part of, an, of one new humanity in Christ. The summer of 2020 and continuing on has been a renewed season of racial reckoning. The underbelly and anxiety of this has been the easy cover of whites complaining about violence against buildings, the riots, with greater ferocity than complaints about the underlying violence every day against blacks and people of color. The increased racism expressed in these past months toward Latinos and Asians, as well as evidences the sense that they are the problem rather than the profound injustice against people made in the image of God through personal and institutional systemic racism. One of the historically predominant white evangelical denominations recently acted to condemn critical race theory. And they did so rather than to speak up and against the social realities that critical race theory attempts to expose. They were more concerned about the theory than about the reality. The assumption seems to focus on the apparatus of reflection on race, rather than to face the gripping and present impact of racism. It is a Christology that sits atop what is rather, what is rather than fundamentally reorders reality itself. I'd like to come back to this with questions in the Q&A time. Whiteness is one of the features that makes it possible for culture to dominate Christology. The second one is maleness. Also inextricably linked to being white and evangelical in America is typically being male. It's male voices that have dominated 
the American evangelical scene, partly through a rejection of women in leadership, not least women in church leadership, and especially against women preaching in the life of the church. Anyone who knows the life of the church around the world is more than aware of the pervasive life-giving ministry of women. CGST knows this, Fuller Seminary knows this. The church around the world sees and understands the, the impossible contribution, impossibly large contributions of women. But for many reasons in evangelical churches, those in leadership are typically male and typically older male and typically white male. They are the ones that are thought as if by nature to be the ones in charge. The long established assumption excludes 50% of the body of Christ from leadership and fits a stereotype that I would argue is not biblical or Christological, but much more of an unformed, untransformed aspect of culture. White evangelicalism in the United States is predominantly male in its public manifestation. And the events last week on the steps of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., only further emphasized that very point, not least with signs that said, Jesus saves. This shows itself to be out of touch with the world in which we live, not least the community gathered in worship. Where are the leading voices in American white evangelicalism? It's not as though there are no well-known women Bible teachers, like Beth Moore, for example, but they are often not held in the same respect as institutional leaders or church planters or public policy advocates or theologians. They are primarily seen as, quote, women speakers, unquote, rather than voices that should lead change, should lead and change the church by a deeply penetrative Christology that rewrites our narratives, sets us free, and resets our social location. As Beth Moore has spoken out more and more publicly, Male voices have harshly criticized her, and many of her adherents who are women have dropped away. What has been fascinating to watch is that at the same time, she's attracted a wider set of women, not so much from inside the white evangelical subculture, who are hungering for a deep encounter and transformation with God that will affect their whole lives. It is her care with the scriptures her honesty in their implications, her refreshing self-critique, and her confidence in God's power rather than in her own. These are the charisms that I see as the fruit of the Spirit in her life and that the body of Christ needs. The next category, in addition to whiteness and maleness, is the way evangelical, white even American evangelicalism is bent on success. The fruitfulness of the church that tends to get the most attention in white evangelicalism is the growth, size, amounts, numbers that can be externally measured, considered success-oriented, and evaluated and rewarded because of that. This is reflective of a set of selective theological influences connected now to corporate or entertainment values. It does not show the fruit of the spirit of an identification with a crucified Christ. It is not a narrative of laying down power, but of public success measured by benchmarks of influence with social or economic power. Being invited to be uh, by the President of the United States to be one of his, quote, evangelical advisors is the height of this convergence and this crisis in the United States. The megachurch model symbolically distills these tendencies and maximizes efficiency and scale as a value. This all makes sense once you embrace and assume that church means standing inside this non-Christological paradigm. It's just the environment and not itself the focus of attention. It is the assumed basis for all that is done on top of that platform, it is like paint on a canvas, not evidence of a new creation. This does not mean, of course, that all good disappears. 
or that truth is absent, or that faithful servant does not occur in megachurches. Of course, that's not true. But all those things happen often to the side or on the back or on top of an industrial strength engine that is being driven by the growth machine, which is not itself a kingdom value. The multi-billion dollar evangelical industrial complex is driven by achieving statistical, financial, and production quality, and letting that show that keeps the audience coming back, and it keeps that audience giving financially. They follow numbers, rankings, quality that drives the machine more than the evidence of true wisdom. The pandemic makes this inclination all the more evident. Preaching at such a church, I was once introduced as a preacher for a night of what they called star-studded worship. Imagine, star-studded worship. There is only one star in Christian worship. In light of these three prominent markers, white, male, and success, the result looks like white, male, success culture wrapping itself in biblical language, but not showing the Christological fruit by the spirit of love, mercy, kindness, justice, or more. At a time when the racial and gender landscape of the United States is rapidly changing and challenging the vestiges of white supremacy and of male dominance, white evangelicalism has become very nostalgic. No wonder so many have been taken with the notion of make America great again. It's a nostalgic phrase. That very slogan fails to reflect anything about the inherent character of the gospel, but instead uh, of something quite different. It does not feed a picture of reconstituting and reordering our lives because of the gospel's transformation. Native American, Black, Latino, and Asian stories are not truly heard and trusted in such churches as the ones I'm describing. Their narratives have to be, quote, vetted by white male evangelical voices that claim a biblicism that is belied by their words and their actions. This is the whirlwind that brings the enterprise of white evangelicalism spiraling down in the culture wars of today. Even in today's press, so many different voices expressing the death of evangelicalism and potentially the death of the church in America. While these may be reactionary words at the moment, they do not fail to grasp the urgency and crisis that I actually think is upon us. White evangelicalism in America shows itself to have bankruptcy at its core not just in its policy or presidential preferences. Back to John Stott and Franklin Graham. On a trip with John Stott that I took, primarily giving lectures in various Indian seminaries, we had a Sunday afternoon venture to go in search of the elderly mother of an Indian missionary currently serving in Vietnam at the time that this trip took place. He asked if John would go and find and call on his mother the next time he was in India, and John said he would do his best to do so. This was the afternoon for fulfilling that commitment. We had her name and a region in the city of Madras where she lived, but we didn't know any further information. We had an Indian pastor with us, and with those tiny helps, we set off to try to find her. It took a few hours with no success and no confidence of success. We were literally wandering in the streets of Madras trying to find an elderly woman who lived in very, very poor conditions. There was no precise address. We just had her name and the area that she might live in. We were, in that sense, without human hope and still by John's commitment to his friend, we persisted. Suddenly, after several false hopes, 
we seem to have perhaps come up with a lead. A man unknown to us led us further and further into the burrowed layers of a particular neighborhood in India, in Madras, eventually into a common courtyard or two, until finally, and remarkably, we had before us this sweet, elderly woman, mother of the man who wrote to John from Vietnam. He described her as a dear lady who was losing her teeth one by one. Would John please go and see her? She immediately knelt before us and kissed John's feet, and she asked immediately if he would preach for her and to her. After an honorific small rug was found and John was positioned on top of it, this simple woman knelt with her hands open to hear the word of God. The man who spoke to scholars and leaders all around the world and in Madras that day, now offered in the clearest and most appropriate way, a compassionate and convicting sermon of God's love for the world, including for this woman's son and for she herself. He prayed for her. She kissed his feet again. The man who preached to tens, maybe hundreds of thousands, was no different than the man who preached for the one person. This was not about power, but wisdom. Not about being male or white, but about being human. Not about being successful, but being a servant. Now, I want to believe that Franklin Graham would have such stories himself. But that is not what is at least publicly visible. Out of the same seedbed that they both shared of evangelical faith comes two very different manifestations. Yes, one comes from America and the other from Britain. But in a deeper sense, they come from different social locations and surrounding cultures, but they actually share quite similar Christologies. Their written statements of faith might be quite similar to one another. But the display of the implications of that Christology seems to be quite different. Both men are mature and complex. Both had complicated relationships with their highly public and influential fathers. Both were born into an ecosystem that was feeding them in particular ways. Both are more than entitled to their distinctive journeys of soul before God and before the audiences that in the call of God, they sought to live out as their vocation. Contrast between the two, however, does seem to tell a significant story. The gospel landed in John's life as a counterpoint to his wealthy and prominent medical family narrative. At an early stage during World War II, John's father was a highly prominent heart surgeon. And it was after his conversion as a young man that he declared himself a pacifist because of his faith. For two years during the war, Living under the same roof, John's father did not talk with him. They eventually reconciled. John eventually was no longer a pacifist, and his life proceeded as someone who would have defended just war. He entered eventually the Anglican Communion at a time when evangelicals were a very small and beleaguered minority. He had been converted at a school as a boy, and then discipled by the influence of that evangelist for many years. This man, man's name was affectionately called Bash, John Nash. And he wrote to John as a schoolboy every week for five years to help nurture him as a disciple. Franklin was raised in the home of one of the world's most famous evangelicals a person of deep character and passion for Christ and for the Bible and for its message of salvation hope. He worked very hard and did lead an exemplary life, private and public, primarily marked by personal piety. 
it was an evangel of individual salvation, internal deliverance, biblical dependency, church allegiance, evangelistic commitment and zeal. This is the gospel of the American Bible Belt. It is a gospel that taps into the cultural location, a religious strategy that names true things, but that are stripped of surrounding truths so profound that they lead to another kind of Jesus, or at least they are susceptible to that. God can and does use almost any kind of messenger. But the evangel it represents, in my view, especially in this kind of white American evangelicalism that I'm describing, misrepresents so much that has become problematic, especially as in recent years as it has become tied to President Trump and the repeated deflection of all the immoral and abuse theologies tied to the Trump administration. All this, Frank Franklin has publicly affirmed again and again as a person who was God's anointed leader for the United States. This evangel is submerged in a culture of power and self-interest. What makes the story of John Stott especially remarkable is the way the evangel set him free from his cultural location. He began inside, deeply inside, a highly privileged, very economically wealthy family. John leveraged the gifts of privilege, but he did so attuning himself as he grew and matured as a disciple to an entirely different vision of a kingdom that was not about empire, English or otherwise, and a normativity that was not about his own power, but was about trying to be evidence of the reflective power of Christ in vulnerability that was not about success, but about truth and obedience and servanthood. Gestures of kindness, cultural relocation, shows up in a prominent way in the Lausanne Covenant. At the first Congress, called jointly by Billy Graham and John Stott, when the voices and lives of non-Western Christian leaders were finally heard and trusted on an international evangelical stage in a way that one could argue had never happened before. The evangelical world changed by its adoption because it was the story of the evangel confronting culture and hearing voices that are not powerful, successful, mega, popular, or dominantly white or male. This is the fruit of a, of a wise life centered in Christ, a Christology that trumps culture, not the other way around. So culture or Christology, Christians cannot and should not deny or reject culture. And we must not pretend that we are not shaped and compromised by it. What we must discover is how much more sway culture typically has than our Christology. It is not clear the American white evangelicals understand culture seriously enough. But what does seem clear is that they do not allow our Christology to be transformative enough, self-critiquing enough of the water in which they swim. Without that deeper work, we are to speak and to show the evangel to the world. It will fail the God that we claim to honor and to serve. Let me stop there and turn to our evening's respondents. Thank you, Mark, for the inspiring lecture and to invite us to reflect on how should we allow our Christology to transform our culture and the way we live that's about truth, obedience, and servanthood. Now, two members of our faculty will give their responses to Dr. Lapleton's lecture, and the Q&A session will immediately follow the responses. Just a quick reminder again, um, if you have any questions or comments, you can post them on our website in the live streaming page. You can scroll down to the web page and after the live streaming um, in Putonghua, there is a Q&A session where you can input your questions or comments after inputting your names. 
So let us um, now welcome our respondents. Um, Dr. Celine Yun, Assistant Professor of Theological Study, and then later we'll have um, reference Dr. King Yip Lui, Heavenly Blessing Professor of Theological Study. So welcome. Thank you, Mark, for, for, for another in, inspiring lecture. I uh, uh, appreciate your remark that, that theological scholarship is, is personal narrative. So I guess I'll fill everyone in with my own history here. I grew up in, in a Christian home here in Hong Kong I would describe myself as a conservative e e evangelical, if that means respecting the, the utmost authority of, of, of scripture and believing that the, 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 the mission of the church is, is to, to convert people to Christ. My ex exposure has been as such until I found myself setting foot in, in Princeton Theological Seminary five years ago in, in New Jersey, where I did my PhD in theology. New Jersey is, is a deeply d d d d d d democrat state, and that is to say as a conservative, I spent five years in, in a very a very liberal place. I will spare you all with the details of my adventure in Princeton as a conservative woman. But for now, I'll just say that while I agree with, with Mark, that American e evangelicals are in a crisis, I'd like to give them at least some credit. My experience at Princeton was that, I, I, ironically, it is often the, the, the conservative e evangelicals who, who, who befriend in, international students and go out of their way to help us. I went to many churches near my area, and it was almost in, in, impossible to find a, a congregation that is multiracial. They are always I, either all white or all black or all a, Asians. But the only one church I came across that was truly multiracial with roughly one third of the congregation white, one third black, and one third Hispanic, was in 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 fact an an e e e e e e evangelical church led by a a, a white couple in. In these two lectures, I think Mark has highlighted a clear and present danger in the church, that what we hold as, as, as Christian faith may in fact not be the true gospel, but only a, a reflection of our own ideology. In the words of Gran Luis Segundo, we are capable of deforming doctrine in order to, to protect our own interests. This warning also reminds me of Karl Barth's 
warning of, of her pilitual hyphens. The hyphens we in, intentionally or unintentionally put between the gospel and our own, our own culture. Chinese Christians, for example, without very competitive culture, tends to equate a, a, a good Christian kid with being hardworking and a, a, achieving good academic results. We like to listen to, to testimonies that highlight success as some form of, of defined blessing. Yet this re reflect more our, 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 our social location than the content of the gospel. While a, a lot of churches are active in, in, in social services in Hong Kong, a lot of the church leaders think the church should take on, on, on a quietist at, at attitude towards politics. Even during the, the, the heated and, and, and anti-extradition protests, since June 2019, that rocked the whole city. This attitude, however, coincides with that of, of a particular generation here in Hong Kong, who, 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 who treasure prosperity and, and stability. In, in today's lecture, Mark has offered an overwhelming contrast between two e e evangelical figures. Both grew up in 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 privileged families, but one managed to to be free from his own own culture and class, while the other seems to proclaim a, a gospel that only reflects his own. Social location. I, I think Mark has helped us. Um, I, I think Mark has helpfully shown us how the two differ not so much in the content of, of their Christology as in the integration of their faith. As a systematic theologian, I hope to. to, to to reiterate a, a, little bit, a, a little bit more on, on, on what Christology am, amounts to. First, Christology attempts to speak of the un, unspeakable cross, the unspeakable horror of the cross, on which God in the person of the Son condemn all human sin. The cross precisely denounces the human status quo. I believe that we fail to understand the cross if we fail to understand this divine no, or if we restrict it only to our personal lives, or to spiritual matters in, 
instead of the whole human condition. One way of, of, of letting Christology reform our lives is to acknowledge that all that is taken for granted in our culture has to be transformed. And, and this first person pronoun is, is important. The cross does not only condemn our, our opponents, but our ways as well. Second, Christology attempts to speak of the humiliation and, and suffering of God in the person of the Son. Jesus Christ identified with the poor and loved to sur surround himself with social outcasts and sinners. He was himself a refugee and a political criminal. I notice, however, that the Chinese churches love to preach the, the disciplinary and authoritative poor a lot more than, than the lowly and even politically sensitive Christ. And even with Christ, our culture makes us focus more on, on the victorious side of him. In, in, instead of the humble and, and compassionate side of him. One way of letting Christology reform our lives is to rediscover the, the, the Christ who is for the sinner. In, in some, I've learned that that Christology is not only asking a who question, as in who is Christ, but equally a, a whom question. For whom is Christ proclaimed? We have to ask, does the Christology we proclaim only serve the, the, the interests of a certain group? Thank you again, Mark, for, for, for your lecture. Well, thank you, Mark, for your two illuminating lectures. I'm so glad I can hear this reflection from a KOL, or key opinion leader, of, the, of American evangelicalism. Since Mark begins his lectures with some personal story, I would do the same to let Mark and others understand where I come from. I went to a conservative reformed theological seminary, Westminster Theological Seminary, Philadelphia, for my MDiv degree. To broaden my um, theological perspectives, I took classes in Princeton Seminary and in Union Seminary, New York. And I almost went to uh, Fuller for my PhD studies, but that's another story. I still identify myself as a child of American evangelicalism. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Jonathan Edwards, and I have taught um, on American fundamentalisms and evangelicalism here in CGST. So thank you, Mark, for speaking on a topic that is dear to me. I concur with Mark that American white evangelicalism is very sick today, or at least parts of it. And we need to pray for God's mercy upon his church. President Trump has somehow managed to bring out some of the worst characteristics of evangelicalism. Yes, I understand why some Christians would vote for Trump in the recent election. But when some of my Christian friends denounce the New York Times as a tabloid from the radical left, while they totally ignore the many unfounded claims that Trump has told, I'm troubled. Yes, I don't want school children to have the freedom to declare their own sex, and I don't believe that it is a violation of human rights 
to differentiate between a naturally born woman and a transgender woman. However, I'm also abhorred by the gun violence in America and the abject poverty of the city ghettos among all the riches in America. Why does the church make the LGBTQ movement into an apocalyptic calamity while ignoring the sufferings of the black community? Yes, I believe in the authority of the Bible, yet when someone quotes Genesis 2 and then claims that there is a divine given right of breathing, and this right means that the government cannot ask people to wear a mask, even in a pandemic. I feel baffled by such theological reasoning. Why does culture trump Christology, pun intended, in white evangelicalism? I would like to suggest a few reasons, perhaps speaking with the prejudice of a church historian, which I am. White evangelicalism buys into the mythology of a once golden era of American Christ Christianity, i.e. it's a question about eschatology. What is our theology of eschatology? In my years in Westminster, the Puritans are exhorted as mortal Christians, and Machen and Ventil, which uh, they are founders of the, uh, my seminary, are the buckwalk against anti-Christian modernism. While these people are heroes of faith to me in their own ways, they did not address the burning issues of our days. Sometimes they even choose to ignore the burning issues of their time. For example, the civil rights movement is invisible in Ventil's writing. John Murray defends slavery as not being per se evil in his book on biblical ethics. Um, the book is called Principles of Conduct, which was, which was written in 1957 and was still used as a textbook when I studied there at Westminster in 1992. And Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again, again, notice the word, suggests that once gold, the once golden era of America is now ruined by immigrants, by the liberals, by the radical left, by the Chinese government, or by unpatriotic Americans. According to Trump or white evangelicalism, we need to build endless walls, both physical walls and psychological walls, to reign in these evil forces. Mark has told us how the white church has failed African people in the past and even in the present. White evangelicals need to read their past with a critical spirit. Without an unhealthy nostalgia or an unhealthy sense of the superiority of the past. But we need to understand that the golden Christian America never exists. With a rereading of the past, we can then be open to a more flexible future. Yes, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, or WAPS, is no longer the dominant cultural force in America. But that does not mean that America is on a slippery slope to Satan's kingdom. White evangelicals need to see that God has not left America and will never leave America, not even with a Biden presidency. If we, we, if we Christians can give thanks for the heritage of the Puritans, we can also give thanks for Martin Luther King, for the concern for ecology, or for the push towards diversity in government and in the corporate world. America will not go back to a nostalgic past, and it should not. Sure, not all social changes in America are good, but evangelicals should have the confidence that God is still working today in America. In many ways, white evangelicals have bought into a lot of secular values, 
even as they claim to be upholding biblical values only. Mark has uh, Mark will discuss some of these values in the next lecture. Here I will just single out one particular example, the postmodern hermeneutics of suspicion. According to postmodernism, the society is fragmented into many subgroups and subcultures. Postmodernism has lost faith in objectivity or procedure justice. All truth claims are power Graphs. And we need to unearth conspiracies and hypocrisies all the time. We need to fight at all costs, including demonization of opponents or disinformation campaign to maintain our own turf. We see a lot of this postmodern behavior recently in the white evangelical church. For example, a lot of medically sound pandemic control policies are perceived as tactics by the liberals to control religious liberty. Talks of diversity are automatically classified as LGBTQ ideology. Key opinion leaders who dare to build bridges with non-evangelicals, such as Tim Keller, are sometimes vivified as giving up their orthodox faith. Jesus dined with tax collectors and with the Pharisees. As Mark has said, the church needs to reflect more on incarnation Christology in order to overcome such agonistic mentality, you know, that everyone else who disagree with us, they are our enemies, you know. Lastly, White evangelicalism needs to evaluate their own beliefs critically. There is no pure Christian faith, the world of or the world of all cultural bias, i.e., in their search for a so-called pure Christian faith. Actually, they turn a blind eye to their own cultural bias. All theology are in some way culturally biased, for we are but humans. We can try to be aware of our own bias as much as possible by studying the history of evangelicalism critically and by listening to how others, including other ethnic groups, other Christian traditions, even social scientists or people of other faith, we evangelicals can uh, perceive, can have a better perception of the pressing evils of today. And then perhaps evangelicals can now and can then work with others to make America and even the world a better place to live for all peoples. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Keen, and thank you, Celine, for your responses. So now we are in our Q&A session. We have about 45 minutes. Um, we have been receiving some questions already on the internet. But for those of you who have any questions or um, comments um, regarding um, Dr. Laputin's lecture or for the response then, you're welcome to post your question on our live streaming page. Um, you can scroll down at the end of the page and you will see a Q&A session where you can enter your questions and also your name. So um, let me read the question we have already. Um, so, Dr. Laputin, maybe you can respond to this question. Um, so, um, this audience appreciate very much about um, your um, critiques of the American white evangelical church, which understand her identity more in social and cultural terms rather than through a Christological lens. And to risk oversimplification, I want to see how a true understanding of Christology will help faith communities which are not in power but subdued, not perpetrator of oppression but oppressed, to gain a transformed vision of the identity. Maybe, um, Mark, you can speak a little bit, and then, uh, respondents, you're welcome to jump in. I want to be sure that I'm understanding so the question is, how does a Christology influence 
the experience and perceptions of people who are without power, not just people who have power. Right. So how can a true Christology can help us to have a more transformed identity of our, our Christian identity? Right. Well, let me <clears throat> let me use the example that I did earlier uh, about um, uh, about the influence of the gospel in slave culture, for example. So often, uh, if you go to the Museum of African American Studies in the United States, what you'll find is that this museum has what were called quote slave Bibles. And the slave Bibles uh, had sections of the biblical text cut out that would have given power and value and dignity to people who were without power, namely to the slaves themselves. And the slave masters didn't want the whole Bible to be handed out to people who were learning to read. They wanted them to only have parts of the text in order to subjugate them. What of course happens is that over time, they are readers of the whole Bible. And part of the planting, the deep planting of Christian faith among, slave, among slaves in the United States, and still to this day among African Americans, is that the Bible itself is a book of social transformation. And though they may be devalued by culture, they may be misrepresented in government and in business, they may be poor, and marginalized culturally. They are given value and dignity and worth because of the, of the way that the Bible reveals to them the character and meaning of their, of their lives. Now this experience, of course, is evident around the world. We could probably all give examples of the way this has occurred. But I think it's, it is in part letting the Bible have its own full voice uh, and not be heard only through the lens of a dominant interpreter, whether white and male and American or some other kind of dominant expression of, of biblical authority. So I think that's one key. I think another key is meant to be, and often isn't for the reasons I've tried to give, one of, one of the ways that it's meant to be experienced and discovered is through the church itself a communion of unlike people who come to know and love one another because Jesus Christ alone breaks down the dividing walls of hostility and welcomes the rich and the poor, the white, the black, the, the Asian, the Latino, that welcomes people who are educated and people who have no education, people who are public sinners and who are people who are private sinners or both, etc. cetera, right? And, in that, com that unexpected communion, we wake up to our deeper identity, which is not the social status into which we were born or that we've supposedly earned and fought our way into achieving, but instead into a gift that only God's grace can create called the body of Christ. So the tragedy of, of all the divisions within the body of Christ is not only a wound against God and a wound against Jesus who gave his life for a new communion, but then a failure for people wherever they might be uh, on the social spectrum to rediscover their identity through the Bible and by the embodiment of its teaching in the church itself. So when all of that is broken, the Bible is dismissed, let's say, or it's put to the uses of only some ranks in social hierarchy and used against other ranks in social hierarchy, then in fact, it is literally a dismemberment of the body that Jesus Christ died to save and aches and longs and weeps to make one new humanity. So I think I'll, I'll stop there just as an introductory set of comments. So allowing the Bible to speak the full voice and also through the church community, we can embody what the Bible says. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet we, also, we know, I think, around the world that typically the churches reflect certain social categories and racial categories and gender types and, you know, a, a social expression, which uh, does not embody the whole gospel. And often we're not committed to that, even as a hope or a goal. Thank you. Oh, I uh, just 
add two more remarks. I think sometimes when we read the Bible, we tend to take the Bible's message out of its social context. Uh, for yes. example, we say Jesus is apolitical. Well, actually, right. if you read, you know, Jesus' criticism of the Pharisees, it's a very political yeah. move. Yeah. The other uh, remark I will add is we need to read, you know, Christology written by different people. For example, uh, when I was in America, I took a course from James Cone, a black theologian on black yes. theology. Now, at the end of the day, I don't, there are a lot of things I don't agree with James Cone. But on the other hand, that course was just an eye opener for me. I mean, I, I see things in the Bible that I would never see if I stay just in Westminster. So yeah. we, we need to listen to um, people who speak from different backgrounds, different ethnic groups, to, just to see how things, how different people can see things quite differently from the Bible. Yeah. Right. So we have another two questions that are related to the relationship between the church and the government. So I'm just going to read both of them, and then maybe you can answer them together. Um, so um, evangelicals and Republicans go hand in hand. The relationship is very deep. Is it possible for evangelical to take a neutral position to both parties in the near future? And another related question. Um, People like Jerry Falwell and other famous pastors and powerful evangelicals use their position to influence presidents um, and lawmakers to advance their causes. A lot of people, especially non-Christians, resent this. What is your opinion? That's a quote from the question online. So, Mark, do you have any response to those questions? They're both... Uh... They're both very good questions. Can you read the end of the first question again? Sure. Um, is it possible for the evangelical to take a neutral position to both parties in the near future? Right. Republicanism has been taken to be socially consorted uh, as, a, as a party. Uh, and Democrats have been taken to be social progressives. Um, the question is, does one or the other belong to the church as an identity? And I would say, no, not as an identity. Um, there are things about the gospel which are socially conservative, and there are other things about the gospel which are socially progressive. And the thought of a church or a church leader being identified with a single party seems, by definition, from my point of view, to be enormously problematic because it suggests that the gospel then that you're preaching is being filtered through one political sectarian lens rather than actually accountable to something that's much richer. For one thing, it's not the gospel is itself not binary. That is, it's not a choice simply between one and the other, as though there's only two options. We're talking about the God who holds all things together, the God who is the Lord over all, the firstborn of creation and the firstborn from the dead. That's the God that we're worshiping. So the idea somehow of thinking that our Christology could be reduced to allegiance to one political party seems like pure folly to me. I think uh, there are ways that I'm personally democratic and there's ways that I'm personally a Republican, but I don't really care about those labels. They do not hold any intrinsic value or particular meaning to me. They're reference points in social conversation but they are not reference points in my own theological or political philosophy or actions. So, so I don't think there is such a thing as a neutral position, nor do I think there should be a neutral position. I'm not arguing for a neutral position. What I'm arguing for is a deeply vested position in a whole gospel for all people and a gospel that speaks at the most profound levels internally, but also at the most public levels as well. That's not a neutral position. It's not a, a way of, quote, staying out of politics. I don't, I don't think a Christian should stay out of politics. If you mean politics by politics, sectarian politics divided around, along party lines, that's a different conversation. But if you mean it's possible for a Christian leader to stay neutral about the uses of power in the culture that we're a part of, 
I don't see how a Christian who calls Jesus Lord can remain neutral about that. If I, if I'm seeking to follow Jesus as Lord, it reorders all power. It calls my power in question. It calls any other person's power in question. It talks about how to rightly order power in a way that reflects the goodness and justice and truth of God. So I don't think neutrality is or should be a goal. Uh, and I don't think I would, I would encourage it really for anyone who might be listening to these lectures. Working out how we live that out, of course, is a hard challenge. And that's partly why we're having these conversations. Now, the second question, can you read the end of that again sure. as well? Um, let's see. So many famous or powerful evangelical pastors use the position to influence presidents and lawmakers to advance their cause. And a lot of people, especially non-Christian, we sense this. Um, what is your opinion on this? Well, there's a number of things to say about that. Um, but fundamentally, I would side with the people who resent it. Um, and the reason I'd put it that way is that often when Christians are given access to political power, especially when their power is primarily located in the church or in the Christian community, they go to the government trying to get the government, quote, on their side as though it is about seeking governmental favoritism rather than bringing to the government a Christian critique of their government or of the problem that we're looking at, whatever it might be. So often in the cases of people like Jerry Falwell and in President Trump's Evangelical Advisory Board, for example, I know from knowing a number of people that are in that group that one of the things that they would all say is true of that group is that they are not self-critiquing. They go because they want the president to do their bidding. So for a pluralist culture to watch Christian people look for special favor from the government feels to me as though that's not looking for justice from the government, which includes, yes, justice toward the church, that's legitimate to argue for, justice for society in general, that's also uh, part of the work of the church, to argue for justice for different racial groups, genders, etc. Those are justice issues around which uh, we should be uh, not looking for our, for favor that's going to preference our agenda, but instead uh, hold the government accountable to God's agenda for what is actually true and good and, and righteous, not just for the church, but for people made in God's image. Now, that's a, a delicate balance that has to be done in a whole variety of different ways in order to be able to be uh, wise and, dis and discerning about these things. I'm not suggesting this is easy at all, but I think that's more like the model that I would command, uh, standing into the into the to the conflicts and trying to bring a, a, a more adequate Christian worldview rather than seeking favor from the government for Christians, which I don't think is actually what we're called to. Right. So standing in conflict and bringing the critique to the government instead of trying to gain flavor from it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you I, I want to add something again. I think um, the evangelical church in America, sometimes they are too fixated on specific issues, like yeah, abortion, yeah. for example. You know, they're thinking about overturning Roe versus Wade all the time. But I think, you know, the, Ameri the, the Bible actually teach many things about justice. It's not just one thing. And I think no political party, you know, fulfill the biblical model completely. So there should be diversity, you know. So some Christians yeah. study Republicans, some uh, Christians study Democrat. That's that, I think that would be a healthy situation. Yes. Uh, yes. So you just pursue things that is dearest to the to your heart, but there is no one issue that defines so-called the Christian political position. And Amen. secondly, I would suggest individual Christian. Of course, you can. You know, support Republicans, you can support Democrats, you can even join their political machine and, you know, lab, lobby for their party and so on and so on. But for church leaders, for pastors in particular, I would suggest that pastors should refrain from political activity directly. I mean, you can visit at 
president or, or, or senator and pray with him. That's okay. On a personal level, of course, that's okay. But if it's a political event, I think that, you know, the pastor or church leaders to remember the main role of the church is witnessing the truth. We are not an interest group. We, we, our main job is to witness God's justice. And if, you know, this justice can come to fruit in the world, there's God's work. That's not our effort. And we, we, we witness what is the faithful truth of God. And then sometimes we just have to trust God to see how God will, you know, realize his kingdom on earth. Yes. Right. But I, I think I agree with what you've just said, and I think your points are very well taken. The only thing I would want to be sure that, at least from my point of view, uh, is that if I'm having access to talk to political leaders, I do want to talk to them about political things yeah. in the name of Jesus Christ and in light of God's standards of justice, which then means talking to them about things around which there may be political division. My interest isn't the political division. It's about trying to bear witness to the justice of God, which is, I think, what you were just saying, but I just want to uh, put it that way. If, uh, have we just said the same thing, or do you think what I'm saying is is different than what you were saying? No, it is the same thing. It just means in, in public events, we are not trying to support. Our pastors should not try to say, you know, roll for the Democrat. But of course, yes. they can raise those issues with, you know, individual political leaders. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. I want to concur with your, your trying to make a distinction between being, being neutral in politics versus being neutral with, with respect to, to, to political parties. I think yes. that, that distinction is very helpful, and I think that that distinction is helpful for, for the churches in, in Hong Kong too because it is very common here that they want to stick to the, 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 the principle of, of the separation between church and state. And a lot of them understand that to mean that church therefore should be, be neutral with respect to politics. But I think that goes against our, the the command to, 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 to love our neighbors because yes. politics is what affects our neighbors the, 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 the most in a lot of situations. So, right. so thank you for, for, for making that, that clear. Yes, thank you very much. Um, there is a related question asking about, you know, there is observation that, you know, there are a lot of minority or even Chinese American Christians seems to be joining, you know, the Trump wagon this year. You know, they are not for, you know, the white racism. What do you explain, you know, these people when they're having this post-Trump attitude? Like, how would you, what, what are their motivation, you think? Right. Well, it, it comes down, I think, to the fact that a great deal of the Christian life is about reordering power and how we understand power in the world. And there are many people that are attracted to Trump because of the way that he demonstrates a kind of um, strongman view of governance, right, that has to do largely with the exercising of force and, um, and the demonstration of, of um decisiveness and direction and authority. This is one of the reasons why, for example, in Africa, uh, there are a lot of African Christians who are really very, very enthusiastic Trump supporters. And it's partly because of the fact that, that the residue of, of tribal life in Africa and its emphasis on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the strong man who's going to lead the tribes is, is a person that that sometimes speaks and acts like Trump. That this is one of the reasons why I find it very ironic that it's the church in Uganda this week that will vote if they follow the past. It will be Christian people who will be some of Museveni's strongest uh, supporters. Why? Museveni is a strong man. He's so strong that many, of course, would call him a dictator. Who supports that? 
interestingly and painfully, I would say, the church. So Miss Evany does not pay attention to people who are poor and in, in need. Women and, and children are, are abused by his government. Whereas uh, the church wants to speak up for Miss Evany because he uses Christian language and because he's seen to be, quote, strong. Now, I don't know if that's true in that, for that justification in the, among Asians and Asian Americans, but I think, uh, you know, Trump's language of strength, success, power, money, influence, and then uh, tying it to certain hot button issues as, as have already been named, like abortion or human sexuality or uh, immigration, that those things are, are taken all together as a way of first getting what we want materially and otherwise, then getting a leader who's going to defend what we want and keep the enemy at bay, and then that's going to protect our values, namely things like abortion or a conservative approach to LGBTQ issues. So I don't know, you'd have to tell me whether you think that's a reasonable explanation for the, for the attraction to Trump of some uh, Chinese Americans. Well, uh, yeah, I think, you know, strong leader, that, that image is certainly part of it. I think the other part is, you know, Mark, you mentioned already about social conservative. Uh, Trump represents a more conservative voice on many social issues, family and so on. And I have to say, yes, Trump has done something I agree to, his emphasis on pro uh, protecting religious liberty, for example. That's something yes, yeah, right. that we can identify uh -huh. with. So, but in general, I think many Chinese want to preserve a conservative social order, like respect of the parents and so on, so those things. And that may explain some of the Latino support, you know, that Trump get to. And uh, so, at least in the rhetorics of Trump and so-called the, the conservative wing, the Democrat yes. is, you know, painted as radical. You know, they want to, how to uproot the whole social order so that yes. you know, everyone is equal and there's no more respected person, no, you know, everyone is equal in that sense. So I think right. a lot of the fear of the upsetting of the social order I think it's what drive you know some Chinese Christian or other ethnic Christian to support Trump. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you for that. I think that's true. I agree. I don't know if I, I don't think I can speak for a lot of people, but for some of the people I know, it could be because of Trump's um, foreign policies because of the way that he's so strong against um, some, some governments, such as um, CCP. I think that could be part of the, the reasons. And also in America, um, I don't know if, if I get it right, but the, the Christian, the Bible Belt is also where the, the, the Rust Belt is, roughly. And before Trump's era, a lot of the jobs were lost to countries like, like Mexico and China. So a lot of people have lost their, their jobs. So maybe partly why they want to hear make America great again is that their jobs could come back to them so that such, such that they can actually have, have their jobs back. I think that, yes, that could be yes. partly why. I, I agree with that as well, yeah. Yeah. But often what that, uh, all of that, both of your answers, I think, are, are ones I certainly would accept. Um, I think often what's less visible inside those answers is really an interest, fi finally, of simply self-protection. And there's something about the gospel, Christology itself, this is why I chose that word, that is about vulnerability and about becoming interested in the other not just in what we have a prerogative to grasp. So I'm not saying anything of, of, that that leads to a direct plan for economics or for job security or uh, those kinds of things. But I think it, it's based on an assumption, a cultural assumption, I would say not a gospel assumption, that 
that self-interest should come first or often legitimately can come first. And I think from a Christian point of view, that has to be at least wrestled with. And if I saw those that were surrounding Trump critiquing that, even while they're also affirming it, in other words, setting it boundaries as well as giving it uh, its own head, then I think I would feel differently about those arguments, uh, which I think do have a place in, in things that we should carefully consider. Thank you. Um, so for our next question, if the current trend among the white evangelicals continue, what, in your opinion, would become of evangelicalism? Um, another related question, do you think now is a turning point for the white evangelical churches to reflect their value, or you would think that they would you know, move on to the extreme ends? Well, based on where we are right now, I have to say that I'm more skeptical than optimistic. Um, I, I'm not saying that with any pleasure or with any feeling that I'm even being dramatic. I just think it's descriptive of where we are right now. Um, despite all that's, that's going on, uh, even right now, there are people who are still defending in every way the legitimacy of the complaints against the election and of the violence that was used and uh, all of that, right? So there's no, there's not a pervasive sense I have of of deep reflection about this. It's much more, it's much more intuitive and reactionary, rather than self-critical and and repentant. Um, and I think people are showing their true colors that they're more aligned to this agenda rather than humbling themselves before God and asking for God to give us new eyes and a new heart and a new mind to perceive ourselves and our neighbor and uh, our nation and the world around us in a different way. Um, I certainly think that there are some institutions, for example, even today, there are maybe four, three or four institutions that I'm aware of that have put out some really very strong and repentant statements of their own sense of complicity in this narrative. Um, and in the letter that I put out last week, I was trying to say we have to call ourselves into account, though Fuller would not want to see itself as part of, that, of this narrative that I'm describing. There's no way that we are not in some way entangled in it and guilty of some of the same things, even, on, on, uh, even though we may occupy a different social location and have a different social critique, we can still be caught up in the same problematic uh, issues, right? So, so let's admit that of ourselves. I think what I'm in, being invited into and what I'm inviting others into here is into a sustained conversation with, with different people from different racial, um, theological and uh, denominational contexts to have some sustained conversations about the crisis itself. Because to some degree, we have to feel our way toward as much of a, of a fresh narrative that we can all share in in order to be able to then share in acting together in a way that could be really more publicly productive. Right now, there are just endless stories. Uh, I wonder if all of you are aware of a quite wonderful um, video. I don't know if it's been translated into Chinese, but it's one of uh, the, of the TED Talks uh, given by a Nigerian woman named uh, uh, Adiche is her last name, Chimamanda Adiche. And it's called The Danger of the Single Story, The Danger of the Single Story. And uh, she basically offers us a kind of social anthropology of why there are, is almost never one story. So what I'm not trying to argue for is we all need to come together and tell the same story. That's not, that's not a good idea even as a goal, let alone as a, as a possibility. So, um, but what I am saying is a shared narrative, even in our differences in our narratives, that could bring us close enough together that we could then begin to conceive the church in America in a different way. And we have not been very good at this. We're inventive around secular values. We're not very inventive around gospel values. 
how do we become more Christ-like is not the dominant question in the American church. And that's partly what I've been trying to say this evening, or tomorrow morning rather, <laughs> is that we are called to become conformed to Jesus Christ individually and communally. But that's not our goal, not, not predominantly within the white evangelical movement. It's, it's how do we be, retain being white and dominant and male and successful and powerful and influential. Those are the questions that have driven so much of the American church, not how do we become conformed to Jesus Christ? How do we lay down our power? How do we surrender in the name of Jesus to uh, our, our friends, our neighbors, our family, and including our enemies in ways that represent the unexpected love and sacrifice of Jesus? Those are surely the qualities that are meant to be part of what the body of Christ throughout history, when it's been at its best, that's what the church has been called to. That's what we are called to in this moment. And I've been trying to highlight the way that the church, the evangelical white church in America, loves using that language. And it preaches it, it writes about it, it teaches it. But it does it within the confines of a social structure, which actually makes becoming Christ-like by definition, actually not the goal. It's actually to be white, male, American, dominant, successful, powerful, etc. That's, it's our destruction. So when I think about will evangelical Different parties, you know, different political um, point of views and, and ethnic groups. Right, yeah. right. Well, I know when I was a pastor, there was a period of time uh, in the congregation that I was serving in Berkeley, California, that we were working on some of these issues and we developed a, a simple liturgy that we used for several months as a way of trying to just keep remembering these first order things. So it went something like this. I would get up and I congregation would say, you are not God. And I would say to them, you are not God. And they would say, we are not God. And then we would name a number of other categories where we wanted to remember at the start of our worship that these are not the things that we're here to worship, that we have to lay these things down. So it was a repentance, yes, but it was also a denial, a rejection, uh, yes. It was a, a seeking after what is the right ordering of power where everyone is called into account, not just the left or the right or anyone else and then trying to figure out how do we live together in the newly ordered power of the kingdom of God. Thank you. Yeah. I want to you know, repeat actually something I've said already in my response. I think being a Christian is an adventure. You know? we, we are open to God, what, is, what God is doing today. I think we, we evangelicals tend to be um, conservative in the sense we, we don't want to go into anything controversial unless somehow we are persuaded we have the absolute correct answer. Like, yeah. for example, uh, uh, whatever, in some sexual issue, we think we have the right answer. So we just keep repeating that right answer. But yeah. I think, you know, the church needs to be open to things that we don't have a final answer. I mean, we, we may have, for example, uh, abortion is not uh, pleasing to God in some way, but does it mean making abortion illegal in all situations is a good thing? I mean, there, there right. a big step between the two, you know, abortion is morally okay versus, you know, banning all abortion. But I think a lot of times we Christians are afraid to, you know, discuss about things we are not sure we listen to one another and see how we can find a path that everybody can walk in. I think that's something yes. the evan evangelical church need to, you know, take the, take the courage to walk in this role. And secondly, just the question about, you know, what would happen to white evangelical if it continues, you know, the way it is now. And I think, well, it's just, it would just decline. I think the, democracy, uh, the, the, the demography of the United States is just they will have declining influence. And something new will come up. Like Mark has said, the evangel will never die. So the church will just have a new face. What will the new face be? We don't know, but I know the church will survive. Right. 
Well, and I do think I agree with all of what you've just said. And I, and I think that one of the really quite exciting things is that some of the most wonderful demonstrations of the gospel that I'm seeing in the United States are coming from multi-ethnic, multi-racial communities that are literally creating a new kind of church for the 21st century that does not look like and is not structured like. It does not defer to authority in the same way as typical churches have done in the past. So that's an example of something new that's coming out of the brokenness. And I like the word adventure very much. Um, another word that I think fits alongside adventure is that God is a God of surprise. And he does things that we would never uh, be able to have anticipated if we're open to that. Um, and that often does then call in question, not, not endlessly and, and not at every point, but it calls in question tradition and structures and formalities that we might have become uh, overly used to. So the next question so, probably for Dr. Yun. Um, so an audience um, comment on Dr. Yun, you make a good observation that conservative, quote unquote, churches welcome ethnic minority. I too had similar experience being a Chinese seminary student in America. What set churches apart from other white evangelical churches in your um, experience? Actually, what I meant was that um, in my experience, at least, maybe I could not speak for a lot of people, but in my own experience at, at Princeton, it's really uh, often is the case that it is white e e evangelicals who, who, who are friendly to, to in international students. It's not something that I could explain, but that's actually the case. And a lot of them are, I have to say. So that's why in my, in my response, I wanted to say that I want to give them at least some, yes. some credit. I agree. Thank you for that. I feel that, um, again, it's my own experience. A lot of the, 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 the liberals in, in Princeton, I think they are very, um, very conscious that they have to be in, in, in the right place along the, the, the political spectrum. A lot of them, I feel that they like to point their finger to the people on the other side, but they don't really um, reflect on how they actually treat the the people they they claim to love. That's actually my my experience. So I think both sides have their own own blind spots. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Something. Anyway, uh, so I think that we, we've been critical of the evangelicalism, uh, quite critical in these lectures. But you know, there's something good about the evangelical tradition. For example, the concern to spread the gospel. I think that's one motive, you know, a strong motive to let the evangelical church to try to invite people from different backgrounds. It's not the lack of motivation to invite people is what happens when you do get people into your church. Can you make those people comfortable? I mean, that's, that's another issue. And we talk about the liberal church. Actually, in my experience, the liberal church in some way is not that liberal at all. I mean, I studied in, as I said, I took courses in Union Seminary. I think Union Seminary in some way is as narrow-minded as Westminster Seminary. It's just narrow-minded yeah. in their different ways, you know. So, um, right. so, I mean, the evangelical church is not, does not have a monopoly on being narrow-minded. Um, and, and thirdly, you know, I actually, I was a pastor in a church in New York City, and we, our, my church in New York City is a multi-ethnic church. We have a Hispanic congregation, an English congregation, and a Chinese congregation. I preach in the Chinese congregation, I preach in the English congregation too. I don't know Spanish, so I can't preach there. Anyway, so uh, for a while, the church, the church was my church, First Baptist Church of Flushing, was founded in the 19th century, I think. 
Um, but anyway, for a while, uh, we actually have a Chinese person as the senior pastor of this uh, multi-ethnic church. Now it's a American, white American again, but there was a while when there was a time when there was a Chinese pastor who is the senior pastor. So there are evangelical churches who try to, you know, be, try to be multicultural, like American societies. So um, I don't want, so I want people to know that the evang evangelical church in America is also diverse. White evangelicalism is just part of the evangelical church. It's not the whole of the evangelical church. Yeah. Um, I'm just mindful of our time. And um, thank you, um, Mark, for your inspiring um, sharing and lecture today. Do you have a few words that you would like to say to us before we finish our lecture today? Just that I appreciate very much, of course, the good word for American evangelicalism because there's many, many good words to say about it. And uh, if I wasn't speaking under the title, The Crisis of American White Evangelicalism, I would have a very great deal to say about what is healthy and positive. But the assignment that I've been working on has been, how do we describe the crisis? And uh, well, it is certainly the case that there are many manifestations of evangelicalism that are not marked by this culture of, of whiteness um, and maleness that uh, are thriving, not only in the United States, but obviously in places around the world. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. There is still a dominant presence of, of white American evangelicalism that I think is the problem that we're trying to, uh, that I'm trying to work out this week. Uh, but I'm grateful for anyone who wants to speak about the positiveness of what's happening as an antidote to my critique. I would just also say that um, one resource that I would like to point you to is a book um, that was first a set of lectures that was given uh, that were given at Fuller uh, by a number of people. But the title of the book is Can White, and that's in quotes, Can White People Be Saved? Uh, and it's a book uh, in which the leading lecture and the title came from his lecture uh, was given by uh, Dr. Willie Jennings at Yale, who is actually a Fuller alum, and who uh, gave a lecture which you can find online uh, under that title, Can White People Be Saved? And it's Willie Jennings, and then it's me giving a response to Willie Jennings' um, lecture. And in that lecture, he's defining whiteness not about melatonin color, as it were, uh, the color of our skin, but about a social framework called whiteness, which is what I've been primarily talking about. And, um, and so if people are wanting uh, a specific resource to follow up on, that would be one too. You can easily find online the lecture, the video of the lecture, and my response to the book, you can find online as well. Thank you again for tonight and for your attentiveness. And I look forward to two more sessions together. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark. Do you have any? This one? No. Okay. Thank you, Mark, for your inspiring lecture. And so that is for us today. And I'm looking forward to see you tomorrow and um, two more days of lecture. Bye bye. <laughs>